kind of like power forward hump day, <laughs> I think. If we're truly doing three phases and, and this is day two of phase two. Um, so what's that now? That is true because it is also Wednesday. This is, yeah, I don't even want to go to the triple. I don't know what that, I, we've delved into it a little too much probably at this point. But uh, thank you very much to all of you for joining us for phase two. Um, we will begin this morning with a presentation from Paul Alvarez from Wired Group. Um, Paul, like all of our speakers, um, our, our esteemed speakers, have um, tremendous experience in the field and tremendous backgrounds. We are not going into folks' bios in full, but they're all available via the Power Forward website. So without further ado, Mr. Alvarez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to maybe start with a little bit about uh, my perspective on the smart grid. You can see that the title of the presentation, Getting the Smart Grid for Free. Uh, I truly believe we can get the smart grid for free. Um, the question is, how do we maximize the benefits that are available from the smart grid investments? So that's going to be the focus of my presentation today, is the transition between the technologies we've been talking about how to translate those into capabilities, and then into benefits for customers. And I happen to focus on the economic benefits, but um, uh, there's no, there's, there's no uh, assumption that if you put the technology in, in on this side, you're going to get the benefits out on that side. We have a lot of work to do, and it's not just the utilities work. Customers have to work. Um, markets have to change. Uh, regulators have to work. And so uh, we're going to touch on all those issues. Uh, as I go through the presentation. So let me just uh, give you a little preview, a little bit about us and why I think uh, we were invited, I was invited to come speak with you today, how to maximize benefits from customers kind of from two perspectives, uh, kind of a, we're going to do a big picture planning process perspective, which I think fits nicely with what you're doing here with the Power Forward Initiative, and then a little bit about uh, more detailed level, um, uh, that translation I just mentioned between technology and benefits. Um, I have a couple cost-benefit analyses for you uh, based on the work that we've done, um, both on the smart meter side and a separate one for the smart grid side. Um, I'd be happy to know those, those benefit-cost analyses come out favorably uh, for customers, but again, there's a lot of, um, a lot of pitfalls um, and transition challenges along the way that we have to talk about. I think we want to get those out in the open. My job here today is not to resolve these issues for you, it's to bring them to your attention. And so if I identify them, raise them, you need to resolve them. I'm going to try to stay away from, although it's hard for me, I'm going to try to stay away from being prescriptive um, and a little bit of best practices that we've seen. So um, a little bit about us. We are um, subject matter experts in a bunch of areas that are kind of related to the smart grid, DSM programs, RPS compliance and incentives, time varying rates, uh, performance measurement, um, but I think the reason I was invited is our grid modernization experience. We, or my teams, have done the only two comprehensive um, evaluations of actual deployments post-deployment. So what benefits did we actually get? And the first one of those we did was in the Smart Grid City for Excel Energy, uh, Boulder, Colorado, 2010. We also did the evaluation here um, for the PUC in 2011 of Duke's uh, Cincinnati deployment. And so um, we've used those experiences since then to kind of build a small business. We uh, typically work for consumer advocates um, since 2017. Just this year, we work for consumer advocates in California, Massachusetts, Kentucky, uh, and New Hampshire. Full disclosure, we also work for the uh, Consumers Council here in Ohio and uh, also for the Environmental Defense Fund. Um, we have a book out, Smart Grid Hype and Reality. I have some copies. Despite the title, the book is not anti-smart grid. It's anti-putting investment in and not getting everything we can out of it. So that's, that's the goal of the book, is to help describe um, what those um, challenges are and how to overcome them. So to start with the big picture, planning. What do we want these investments to do for us? We want better reliability. Well, how much better? We want to accommodate more PV solar. We want to accommodate electric vehicles. Well, how much more PV solar and how many more electric vehicles do we want to accomplish? Do we want to be able to accommodate? 
I think it's important to be specific about these goals um, in advance because when you go to the design phase, you need to know what you're shooting for. And that design phase is not just the work of the utilities, it's the work again of markets, of customers, and of regulators. So we'll hit on these themes you know, throughout this little introduction today. Um, then we have to do the evaluation stage. You're very familiar with this part of the process, right? It's a stakeholder engagement process. Um, the utilities come and present, propose what they want to do. The uh, 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 industrial customers want to have their say. The advocates want to have their say. Um, what we need to have is a conversation that discusses, well, what are the benefits and costs of these things? Um, if we can't afford everything that we want, what's the best way to prioritize? What are the trade-offs? What's our risk tolerance? You know, we do work for um, TURN in California, the consumer advocate in California, and the regulators there were adamant that they want any PV solar system to be installed in the distribution grid anywhere at any time with no delay. That's not a reasonable expectation. You know, maybe it's okay if 5% of the installations get delayed 18 months while some part of the grid gets up upgraded a little bit, right? So we have to be cognizant, you know, as a community about what it is we're spending and what it is we're getting and what we want and what we're willing to live with. Um, and so there's that feedback loop, right? So here's what we want. Here's what that's going to cost. Ooh, maybe that price tag is too high. Where do we cut back? You know, how do we cut back? Uh, and that should be a very transparent ongoing process and really what encourages me about the Power Forward initiative and what you guys are all trying to do. Um, I think you're trying to get these things figured out uh, in advance, which I think is, is very wise. Um, the execution phase, um, I know a lot of the utilities are very good at this. Uh, they have project man management offices I think I, I generally encourage. Um, you want to man monitor the deployment speed. Time is money. You know, delaying projects means delaying benefits, which, you know, is not maybe the best for the business case. Um, and then, of course, you got to measure your outcomes. How effective were we at, at accomplishing those objectives we started out with in the planning phase? Um, you start with baselines. Where are we today? Um, you have metrics that you define in advance. We want a 10% improvement in reliability by 2020. That's something you can measure. Improving reliability, maybe not, maybe not quite as precise as you need to be, right? Um, and then measuring that over time. So that's kind of the big picture. And again, I applaud this, this commission for what they're doing here at the, the Power Forward Initiative because I think you're, you're, you're cognizant of this. Um, I want to get down to the next level of benefit now. The, uh, how to translate the technologies into benefits for customers. So we've heard a lot about the technologies. I know in phase one you discussed technologies. Yesterday we heard more about technologies. Um, uh, but the key of, in, in, to these technologies is how do we translate them into capabilities? So there's a lot of work and effort that has to go to putting the technology in to getting the capabilities out. You'll hear things, people talk about things like the IT OT convergence, right? That's a fancy way of saying we got to get our organizational processes, our organizational changes, our operating processes, our business process changes all in a row to get these capabilities out of the technologies we've just put in. So that's a very important step. And then finally, how do we get those benefits on customer bills? So there are economic issues in compensation, which I know you're going to address in phase three that can discourage utilities from optimizing customer benefits. So certain types of benefits like the O&M savings and the revenue theft, you know, revenue improvements from theft reductions, those don't hit a customer bill without a rate case. And so if those benefits follow the deployment, which they typically do, maybe you have a rate case and you get, you know, utilities, um, their, their cost recovery and their profits, um, but then the benefits kick in after well, then you haven't recognized those benefits in the rates, and so that's an issue. Time-based rates, um, uh, participation, the size of the behavior change, and the value of the behavior change, the value of a megawatt year in the market. Those are your key criteria for, for time-varying rates, but what accommodations have we made in our planning on those three issues? And we'll, I'll talk about examples. 
uh, conservation uh, support for smart meters, opt optimized voltage for volt bar control. If you have a throughput incentive, it's tough to get those. It's tough to get those benefits. Non-wires alternatives, great idea. Um, you know, utilities like to spend capital, so that's a tough one. So all these benefits are in flux, and we really need to focus on the outcomes and the benefits to make sure um, that we get out of these technologies what we're expecting. Um, how did we get here? Oh, sorry. Those are the utility changes we talked to, I mentioned. Operational, organizational, um, uh, not easy. And then there's compensation changes I just mentioned. So how did we get here? I like to show this slide that balances rates with benefits, right? And as long as we're getting benefits out of the investments, everybody's, everybody's pretty happy. And traditionally, when it came to the distribution grid, economic growth and development drew, drove distribution and investments, right? So you got economic development in part of town. You got businesses come in, maybe industrial parks, maybe office parks. Then you got retail. You got homes being built, right? So we got to put the capital in. You put the capital in, you get the outcomes out. You get community economic development benefits. With the investments we're talking about today, that one-to-one -one relationship doesn't necessarily hold, right? Utilities are all over the place and how much money they put into demand to side management, for example. And they're all over the place in terms of the benefits they get out of it. Smart meters, lots of different levels of spending, lots of different outcomes. The grid side, lots of different levels of spending, lots of different outcomes. So while it's easy to measure the capital that comes in, tough to measure the outcomes that come out, but the key message here is that putting the technologies in is just your first step. It's what happens with those technologies after they're in that determines the benefits. So I have a couple slides here now that um, I try to, try to quantify the benefit cost ratio of smart, smart meters and smart grid investments. Um, based on my own experiences doing these evaluations, also some data from various places, the assumptions are all in the, um, uh, in the appendix and I, I can answer any questions you have. But I've done kind of a waterfall chart of here's what the stuff costs per customer and here are the benefits per customer. Um, and so I've gotten the cost data, I've, I've obtained the cost data from uh, the smart grid investment grant programs you may remember, uh, utilities had to, you know, provide their budgets. Um, and so there's some pretty good data out there on smart meter costs. And so um, the red bar here is obviously the cost per customer. Um, I've added to the, what I found in this uh, smart grid investment grant data, the present value of uh, operations and maintenance of those smart meters over and their software systems and the licensing agreements and all those kinds of things. Um, over 15 years, that those costs are in there. But there's a lot of costs that aren't in there that customers have to bear. The profits, taxes on profits, um, write downs of existing equipment, uh, interest expenses, right? So you can add maybe, I don't know, 20% to that line probably. And then the green bars represent the benefits. So meter reading cost savings we're all familiar with. Remote disconnect and reconnect savings we're all familiar with. Revenue assurance benefits, theft reduction, and I can give you the assumptions behind all these. The um, meter reading, I think I assumed a dollar per member per month. 90% um, cost reduction in that number over 15 years. That's where that number, that's where that, the size of that green box comes from. Similarly with the uh, meter services, remote disconnect and reconnect. Dollar a member per month, 15 years, 50% reduction. Because most states, Ohio, like most states, does not allow the disconnect feature um, for non-payment. Oh, you have to do that in person. Uh, revenue assurance benefits, I think I assumed 1% theft, and that 50% of that could be um, uh, prevented. Time varying rates, I have a couple different bars there. Low participation and high participation. Um, the participation, again, being a critical factor in time varying rate benefits. And then conservation, I think, mm, I haven't seen a lot of conservation benefits from smart meters. Um, certainly they are available, but again, the throughput incentive challenges that. If you've already automated your meter reading, that benefit's not going to come from smart meters. Um, again, the point is on, on some of these benefits, like the meter reading benefits, the remote disconnect, reconnect, the revenue assurance, 
you got to have a rate case to recognize in terms of you know, rate reductions for customers. So there's a long, again, there's a long way to go between putting the stuff in and getting the benefits out. Uh, and so this, this chart is designed just to show you that the potential is there. We can have our smart meters for free. We got to work at it. Same thing is true, I believe, on the grid side. Uh, again, the same source of data. These are, this is, these are 12 projects. Um, I want to point out that this slide underestimates the IBVC benefits. Um, only 20% of these um, applicants for the smart grid investment grant programs from the, de from the Department of Energy, or I should say it this way, 20% of the customers covered by the, this spending had IVVC. So the details weren't there to be able to split that out. So rather than try to estimate what it was, I just reduced the IVVC but, um, benefits by 80%. So the IVVC, IVVC benefits are much greater than that. But since I couldn't break it out with the cost, I had to, I had to make that adjustment. But again, positive benefit cost analysis is available. The question is, well, what do we want to spend on reliability? You know, does switching help with reliability, advanced switching and distribution automation? Absolutely. Does volt bar control improve, you know, re optimize the voltage and perhaps result in some conservation? Absolutely. But what are the challenges to that? You know, if there's a throughput incentive, how much, how driven are utilities going to be to, to manage that? Right? And I know you're looking at these things in phase, in phase three. I just want to kind of bring them, bring them out as challenges between technology and implementation. Any questions so far? I've kind of been zipping along here. Questions? I'm doing okay? All right. All right, so um, I just want to summarize a little bit. Begin with the end in mind. Talked about that on an earlier slide. Um, these are some very specific examples. How much peak demand do we want to be able to call, to call by when? What reduction in grid voltage do we think we can achieve? What do we want to do with SADI by when? And these are very specific um, parts of your planning process I think you ought to consider. We want to design the capabilities to achieve the outcomes at least, at least cost. Again, not just utility designs, market designs, customer designs, uh, regulatory designs. Engaging the stakeholders, again, the trade-offs, the risk tolerance, um, monitoring the progress and measuring the benefits. A couple of specific examples. I want to I want to spend some time in particular on this designing capabilities, and I just want to give you a few examples of things that I've seen out there, um, in all the, the business cases that I've looked at. Um, some common issues. Uh, one is this issue of the time varying rate participation. So there are many ways to maximize uh, time varying rate participation and get the demand response we want. Um, the two best examples I've seen are are described here. I'm just going to go through them quickly. Um, in Maryland, the distributor calculates and pays a peak time rebate regardless of which retailer a customer chooses for their energy supply. So that's an interesting approach. Um, nothing to sign up for, nothing to do. They establish your baseline on a hot summer day. And the next hot summer day, that's a demand response day, they look at your usage profile. They have an algorithm that does that for them. And then um, they pay rebates based on that algorithm. And that happens regardless of where you buy your energy. That's an interesting approach. Um, in ERCOT, um, the way they do it is they charge the retailers specifically by customer for their energy usage by hour. So whatever that market price is for energy at 5 p.m. on July 17th, um, those charges get allocated precisely by hundreds of thousands of customers to each energy retailer. So those retailers now are responsible for those costs and are therefore innovating, right, coming up with innovations to help them manage that, which is good for the entire market. So just some things to think about. Um, speaking of markets, um, energy management services. We heard a little bit yesterday about standardization of data access. I think that's absolutely critical um, if you want to encourage energy management services 
that help people manage the time varying rates. Again, time varying rates, three components. How many people are participating? What's the size of their behavior change? And what's the value in the market? The size of the behavior change can be influenced greatly by the amount of assistance that, that consumers get in managing those rates. And the applications we heard about yesterday, the iPhone apps, those can be critical in helping them manage those um, services. People don't want to deal with it. They want to set it and forget it, right? Let somebody else help me save money. Um, and I'm helping to pay them and share in that benefit, but everybody benefits um, from those kinds of um, applications and services. We heard about Connect My Data yesterday. Uh, we heard about, about Connect My Data and how it you know, helps um, suppliers maybe not have to do a different standard for each utility. I think it's very critical. And even capacity markets need to change. So I don't know if you're aware, there's a, there's a FERC case under, underway where right now about seasonal capacity markets. PJM has followed Iceland New England's lead and gone to a year-long, year-round capacity market. So um, if you bid capacity into that market, you can't just be expected to bring it in the summertime when all the air conditioners are running. You are required to bring that capacity whenever PJM asks you for it. So if that happens in the winter time, you're going to be penalized if you're relying only on air conditioning load, especially residential air conditioning load. So the design of the market is kind of, it's kind of pre prejudged against um, residential air conditioning loads and therefore, you know, kind of the benefits of time varying rates. So again, lots of different things to think about, many different systems um, that need to be addressed in order to translate technologies into benefits. And I just want to close with a few uh, best practices on benefit cost analyses. We t I've talked about some of these already. Uh, the O&M savings and the revenue benefits might not be reflected in rates without some kind of mechanism to do so. Um, you know, if you're going to put it in the business case, well, then it should be in the rates. If it's not going to be in the rates, it shouldn't be in the business case. So you need some consistency there. We talked about the low time varying rate penetration. Um, the other challenge with voluntary time, time, fee rates, time varying rates, I think, is the marketing cost to recruit people in. It's another thing that can kind of reduce your benefits people don't typically think about. Uh, the throughput incentive we talked about, something we have to work on, and those cost estimates. What are customers going to have to pay? Let's get all that stuff into those cost estimates. So those are my, uh, my tips, my raise, raising uh, of issues, and I uh, hope, hope to help you resolve those in the future. Any questions for me? Paul, thank you very much. Um, I think let's go ahead and do this. We are going to move into our data management utilization okay. panel. My hope is so we've got till 1045 with this unit. My hope is we can wrap, if everyone takes 15 minutes, we can wrap presentations by 1015. That'll leave a half hour for questions to the full oh, panel. The whole, oh, great. Sounds great. Thank you, Paul. Really yep. appreciate it. Wonderful presentation. <laughs> Okay, so first up is Ed. I hope I don't mispronounce your last name. I'm the king of that. Uh, I, I'm a victim of that um, <laughs> with consistency, but Ed Barrowset? Correct. Okay, yes. very good. He's the principal technical leader at EPRI. Ed, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Sure, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, first, I uh, wanted to say a little bit about what it is that EPRI is um, at the risk of so yeah, some things that are redundant. So what do we do? We have a, a lovely little graphic here that describes thought leadership, industry expertise, collaborative model, et cetera. Uh, but essentially, what we do is research in the service of the public, and specifically electric power research. So one of the things we don't do is policy advocacy. Uh, what instead we might be able to do is things like studying what the effects of particular policies might be. Um, so with that in mind, first question if we're talking about data utilization is where is that data? Uh, this graph, I'll explain a little bit more later, but first the punchline, which is that 97% of the data is in polyphase and single phase meters. Now 
Let me back up a bit and explain what this is we're looking at. Last year, I did some research uh, with uh, Idaho National Labs on behalf of the Department of Energy. And the, the uh, task was to, to identify all of the sources of uh, data that are outside the substation fence. So basically everything from the substation all the way along the distribution line up to and including uh, consumer devices such as uh, pool pumps, uh, thermostats, hot water heaters, the ones that are smart. Uh, so we took these 17 different devices, looked at the amount of data that was in each particular kind of a device. So how many bytes essentially was available in, in terms of the data that's in each of these devices. And then this is a simple totally of those numbers, where is all the data? Uh, and as you can see, 97% of it is in meters. The point to this is that uh, this panel is sort of, you may have noticed, you may have designed, that it's, it's somewhat meter centric. Um, this is why, this is why, that's where the data is, is in the meters. And so in order for us to be able to gain the advantages of having all of this data available, we have to make sure that we have the meter data. So the next obvious step, what do we do with all this data? Um, there's some obvious ones that I won't belabor uh, accurately measuring the energy usages. This is one of the most obvious ones. Why do we have meters in the first place, for example? Um, gaining better insight into outages is a key uh, benefit that we have. Using energy more efficiently, proactively be able to spot potential problems. Um, we won't dwell on the details of this, but one of the things I wanted to mention in per, in, for that last one, some, some of these are fairly obvious. Some of these you've already heard talked about. Uh, some of these you'll be hearing in the next panel when they talk about vote VAR compensation. But uh, in particular, one of the things that we are looking into at EPRI is a means by which uh, power quality data, uh, specifically the analysis of harmonics that are, that are not uh, necessarily at an industrial complex. So in my neighborhood, for example, it's a fairly rural residential neighborhood. Um, the uh, measurement of harmonics on the distribution line there at my meter, for example, could be, depending on what it is, could be an indication of, say, something like um, a pine tree that's been leaning a little too close to the distribution line, or it could be an indication of a, a splice uh, about to fail, an imminent failure of the splice. To be able to identify that kind of information and to be able to take it to the point where you can actually do something about it is one of the key points of the research that we do. We look at the, the data, the algorithms, the mathematics behind actually trying to classify this data, but there are a whole host of uh, both obvious and non-obvious uses uh, for which this data can be helpful. So where does the data day go today? Uh, this uh, terribly busy, terribly complex, and perhaps not particularly informative graph is intended to show, if you only take away one thing from this, is it's, it's kind of complex. Uh, and there, there really isn't one size that fits all. So just roughly speaking, on the left-hand side, we've got meters. On the right-hand side, we've got utility back-end systems, the enterprise service bus and all the applications that run there. Now, today, as you well know, most of the information flow is from the devices up to a head-end system. But we've been putting, um, I say we, but collectively we in, in the... Uh, industry have been putting in these devices that are capable of two-way communications for some years now. So we have the capabilities, some capabilities, of sending data back out to the field. Um, how that actually works varies a great deal. Uh, just from top to bottom here, we've got uh, RF mesh is one capability. Um, Powerline carrier is used pretty frequently in Europe. Uh, we've got a combination of either of those or both uh, with the addition of cellular, uh, even plain old telephone dial-up access essentially to individual meters is used. In addition to that, there are other systems depending on where it is and why the device is being put in. Uh, if it's very, very rural, it might be that uh, 
you have some uh, particular point-to-point -point radio just for that. There are some places in Montana I know of that, that have a point-to-point -point radio link just for a meter, but it's very, re re very remote. So how can we better use the data? I've got this divided into two different things. So first, for consumers, and then secondly, for utilities. Um, the, the idea here is that we would like for all of the benefits to be ultimately consumer benefits. But some are more obviously associated with the utility, some are more obviously associated with the consumers. So one of the things we found, one of the, uh, one of the studies that, that EPRI did uh, just last year, in fact, uh, for Hawaii Electric Company, was to look at um, a, a neighborhood, uh, a particular neighborhood that was designed to be capable of doing net zero energy so they, each of the homes was very well built, very well constructed, uh, insulated. They had, each of the homes also was equipped with uh, PV uh, on the roof. And it's Hawaii, so there's a lot of sun available. So the interesting thing was they said, well, we, we have this, but what we would like to do is see if we can, by, by giving more information to the individual consumers, can we affect how much closer each of the homes gets to actual net zero capability, because we know they're theoretically all capable of that. And the interesting thing they found was that not everyone equally benefited from the data that they got. And a couple of reasons for that. One is, uh, what's a kilowatt? Uh, if you ask a typical homeowner, they're not going to really understand the difference between a kilowatt and a kilowatt hour. They might not necessarily understand what actions they do actually affect the bill versus what has a high demand. So I never knew how much my hair dryer cost me each month. Well, not, not really. If you're just looking at the, the um, demand uh, for, for a hair dryer, it's maybe 1,200 watts, but how long do you use it? Uh, not not very long, and it doesn't really have a big effect. So trying to educate consumers about what these things are is obviously a, an important concept. Uh, In-home displays is the other thing that we've done a lot of looking at. Um, a number of places have uh, tried doing a number of things, either opt-in, you can have an in-home display if you care for it, or thou shalt have uh, an in-home display. It's mandated for all the places. Uh, but we found, uh, I'm somewhat glibly summarizing here though, is that it, after about a month, that shiny little technology ends up in a kitchen drunk drawer instead of being used in any kind of way, which I suppose is not too surprising. Uh, but it's one of the things that Paul's alluded to earlier is that this shiny technology doesn't necessarily translate to a benefit unless it's used effectively. And so for utilities, one of the obvious things here is having the right data at the right time is a lot more important than having lots of data. Um, time and again, we have been asked by various utilities to look into better ways that they can utilize the information they're already gathering. There are all kinds of different uh, data sources, metering being the one obvious one. Um, swimming in data is a useful problem to have, but uh, what we really want is to make this effectively used. And so one of the things that we're looking at, um, distributed intelligence, which is one of the things, again, the um, dis di distribution automation is going to be one of the things that the next panel is going to be talking about. So I'm just going to talk about two particular projects. We have many, but two particular projects that EPRI is doing now. Uh, one is fast data via AMI. Now, this idea is to try to see if there might be some way that we can more effectively get data in the hands of customers. So an in-home display, I mentioned, has some, some, some difficulties. Um, if we look at what our individual people who are using electricity actually want, though, um, chances are they, they may say, I want the data where I want it. I want it on my phone, or I want it on my computer, and I want it when I want it, and not just when I happen to be in the kitchen looking at the thing on the counter. So 
This is an attempt to get at just that, um, but in particularly in a cost-effective way. So uh, if, you, if you look at this chart, this graph we have on here, these are the communications data flows that are possible. There are a couple of different ways to do this. So one way, path A here, is how you deal with uh, uh, a, an in-home display. And the idea there is there might be an in-home display that gets its data directly from the meter, and ta-da, there you have data inside the home. Uh, that's good, but uh, typically it requires additional hardware, it requires additional capabilities that aren't necessarily available for other purposes within the devices that are deployed. Second possibility, path B, is having a relay that gets its data from the meter and it passes that information to something within the home, like a wireless access point, and then from there is available to other devices within the home. But there again, it requires an additional link, more communications, more equipment than are typically deployed today. Path C is the one we're actually investigating. And the idea behind it is if we can effectively use the bandwidth, the equipment that both the utilities and the consumers typically already have, then that might be best uh, in that it doesn't require additional capabilities above and beyond what already exists. So the idea there is to have the data come from the meter uh, and flow through the head end and then be sent out via the internet or however uh, we want to distribute it to individual devices uh, for individual consumers. Now you may say, well, we already have that today. There are all kinds of web dashboards and that sort of thing. That's true, but what we're talking about is actually a, high, a brief but high bandwidth connection between a particular meter and a particular consumer's display. And the idea behind that is, um, I confess to being somewhat of a data nerd, so even I would get bored after watching 45 minutes of streaming data from my, my meter. So my, my wife and daughter advised me that uh, normal people uh, don't do that, and so they suggested I derate that by about half, and so um, I think what we actually wound up is a half an hour worth of watching your streaming video. Uh, basically, your data coming from your meter is probably more than most folks would, would realistically use. So the idea there, instead of having this data stream from all devices uh, through this relatively narrow pipe all the time, what we can do instead is just selectively have it turned on. And then the odds are that everyone in the territory is unlikely to be looking at the data at the same time. Uh, so if we have individual on demand, I wanna look at my data right now, then I can actually see the effect of doing things like turning on the stove. Ah, I see, here's, here's what happened to the data usage. Um, oh, what was that spike there? Oh, well, it looks like the air conditioning just turned on. So by gaining some insight into how individual devices, individual usage habits translate into the energy usage, we're hoping to be able to deliver that benefit of educating consumers to be able to understand better how they're using energy and how it affects their bill, um, but without spending a lot of additional money on equipment that might only have that one purpose. The other um, application that we're looking at is this open application platform. And the idea behind that is, well, if you, if you bought a cell phone in 1997, so 20 years ago today, chances are if it had a calculator application in it or a calendar application in it, it's whatever you got by whatever the manufacturer decided they wanted to put in there at that time, um, which is great, but we can do better. And we have in the intervening 20 years. Right now, if you look at a calculator, chances are you all have smartphones. Chances are you've downloaded at least one app to install on there that does things above and beyond what the original manufacturer of that device had in mind when they deployed it, which is kind of interesting. So one of the things that we're looking at is by standardizing uh, an open application platform for meters and other smart grid devices, we might be able to extend the capabilities of those devices and also extend perhaps their, their use, usefulness and their lifetime um, by endowing them with uh, additional applications, additional capabilities above and beyond what they originally shipped with. And so this is an effort that's been ongoing 
Uh, we are involving both manufacturers and utilities in this effort, and the idea here is not to be able to reprogram devices because we have that today. It's to be able to do that in a consistent way that allows an application to be developed more or less independently of what the particular device is. And so those are just two of the many research projects that EPRI does, but I wanted to give you a sample for uh, sort of an idea of about how we might be able to use some of the data that we're gathering in maybe better ways. So thank you. Ed, thank you very much. Uh, we will go ahead and move on to Katrina Polk. Thank you so much for joining us today, Ms. Polk. Thank you. Good morning. Um, thank Good morning. you for the opportunity to speak to the board today or the commission, um, to chairman and the commissioners. My name is Katrina Polk. I'm not um, Ty Roberts, who is on the original agenda. Um, so just a quick background about me, about me. I've been in the industry for 17 years, focused specifically on utility space. Um, I've been seeing the transition from standard meter reading to AMR to AMI, smart grid, IoT. So um, it's exciting times in our industry and in our space. And you know, your forward thinking is going to take us to the next step. So I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about um, a great lead-in or a great lead-in um, or a continuation of the discussion that we just had and how we are actually looking at harvesting all that data that is collected at the meter and the applications that we're able to run on the endpoints to harvest and make those outputs more intelligent to give you more value out of those assets. So research shows us that data creation is growing at 50, 50 times of what it was at 2010. So by 2020, we expect that data creation will be 50 times more than what it was in 2010. That 40% of that data that will be created will actually be generated by machines. Um, so not by an, a, a user, like a computer or a cell phone, but actually generated by machines. Machines can even be metering endpoints. Um, that's 1.7 megabytes of data created every second by every person. That's a lot of data. What we're finding is that the ability to process that data in analytics um, is far less than the ability to generate the data. So only 0.5% of the data that's being generated is actually analyzed. Um, so we have to find ways to take the data that is being generated and use it more effectively at the source of creation. And that's what I'll talk about over the next few, few slides. So a typical smart meter today is capable of taking 32 measurements per second. This is, again, 97% um, of the data that's being generated in smart metering or smart grid is generated by meters. This is where some of that data comes from. That's 2.7 million data points taken per day. And today, most utilities are only using about 24 of those measurements. So there's a lot of unharvested data that can drive a lot of business value to the utilities, and we have to find ways to be able to do that. Um, again, I think EPRI's research proves that a lot of the data, most of the data in our space today is at the endpoint. So how do we get um, continued access to that data to drive the problems, solve the problems that the utility is trying to solve um, more effectively? So a smart meter is not just a smart meter anymore. Again, it is a platform and smart metering is just one of the applications that runs on the meter. So like your cell phone, the smart meter is now a, a device that can house multiple applications. We now look at smart metering as just an application that's running on that platform. There will be other applications like theft detection, volt var, uh, participation in volt var, um, renewables, lots of different applications that you'll have the ability to run on this platform because the capabilities and the processing power of these endpoints is not just for smart metering, but it's for all of these additional applications that drive true business outcomes for the utilities and for the consumers. So the goal here is to move beyond smart to active. Um, we've done a good job of creating a smart grid um, I think the goal now is really to generate an active grid. And we feel that in order to do that, you need to have the ability to compute at the edge of the grid. So putting computing power at every device in the network, including your endpoints. 
um, giving you access to the high resolution data. So all of the data that we talked about that these endpoints have the capability of generating, you need to have access to that data. Not just kilowatt hours, but the, the core raw data and having access to that core raw data at a very high resolution very rapidly um, during the during the deployment of the endpoint will give you the ability to generate outcomes that you weren't able to do before. And I'll talk through a few of those examples um, moving forward. And then being active is not about an individual endpoint participating and being smart, but it's also being able to actively communicate your information to other devices in the network, as well as having those devices communicate to you so that you can actively make decisions um, at the point of creation versus an after effect um, of some of the traditional post-process data analytics that we have today. So in iTron's view, some of the keys in being able to enable this distributed intelligence is having additional communication capabilities. So in order to be active, as we said, it's a conversation not just amongst yourself, but talking to others in the, that are participating in the network. So you need to be able to do things like peer-to-peer -peer communications. So looking at communication types, as, as we mentioned in the previous um, presentation, you know, PLC with a combination of RF gives you some of that ability that you didn't have before. And so now you're not only getting a view into the, into the grid um, based on your own information, but based on your peers as well. And then as I mentioned again, and I'll keep saying over and over, it's about computing power. Um, so traditional metering platforms had amazing amounts of um, computing power from, again, from the time that I started 17 years ago to where we are today, the devices that we're deploying are the equivalent of the you know, first, second generation iPhone um, versus meters that we had that were just dial spinning that gave you a value that someone wrote down. So computing power is, is all important in delivering any additional value add services on our endpoints, just like your cell phone. Um, as technology advances, you need the computing power to be able to um, leverage the capabilities of those devices. And, and we think that's important in, in driving the distributed intelligent um, abilities at your endpoint. And then again, an open application environment. This can't be, this has to be something that allows you not to reconfigure the meters, um, as was stated. Um, but be able to load, remove, download and replace, remove as necessary applications into the environment. And you want to harvest as much of, of the um, subject matter expertise in our industry as you can. So not just a platform that allows a specific vendor to develop and innovate, but allows the utilities to develop and innovate and load those applications on those devices. So it's really important to have an open application environment that allows um, all of the, the brain share to develop applications that will be most important to the utilities to drive those strategic outcomes um, that, and solve the problems that we're facing. And then locational awareness. Um, as we go through and talk about being active, um, not only do you need to be active, but you need to be aware of where you are in the grid. So having locational awareness and understanding your relationship electrically with your peers is important. Um, so that's something that as an industry, we typically have, you know, best case 90%, if you're lucky, um, uh, mapping of your electrical connectivity, um, how your meters are connected to transformers and substations, et cetera, and that changes all the time, right? We have outages, we have upgrades, um, so it's hard to keep that data um, current and relevant. With locational awareness, now your endpoints will have the ability to do that for you automatically. Um, so in real time, you'll always know locational awareness of an endpoint, as well as the electrical connectivity of your grid. Questions? I'm Southern, I talk fast. <laughs> no, thank you very much, okay. Katrina. We'll, when when um, uh, Mr. Dickerman finishes up, we'll open we'll it up to the entire panel for questions. Okay. But thank you very much, wonderful Perfect. presentation. Oh my goodness, I think I, um, sorry. I, That's um, okay, I think we got control up here too, so okay. we're, we'll be okay. There we go. Okay, so the next, I'm sorry, just a couple more slides. Sorry, I, I'm, I exited. I'm, I apologize. Um, so I believe the next slide was to talk about the fact that back office, and I'll keep talking because I know it. Yeah. The back office um, analytics is not competing with distributed intelligence, but it's actually a complement to distributed intelligence. It's
I'll just keep talking and you can come fix it. I know it by heart. Um, so we don't believe that back office analytics is, um, is competing with distributed intelligence. We really believe that it is a complement to one another. So I think we said it earlier, Ed said it, it's about putting the right data at the right place. Um, and in this case, it's not about just harvesting the right data and, and taking those granular pieces of information and, and turning them into better, more intelligent data, even at the back office, but getting the right analytic at the closest point in the system to drive the utility, um, to provide the best utility outcome. So we're talking about back office analytics as well as edge analytics, and depending on the problem that you're trying to solve, where you put that analytic um, definitely changes based on the desired outcome. So. I have a, another graph that shows you know, the way that we actually implement that. So distributed ana analytics in the back office, for example, when you're looking at forecasting, um, you need lots of information from lots of endpoints across your system to be able to forecast your potential um, demand over time. Um, so that's, that's still a very valid use case for back office analytics. When we start looking at theft, Theft detection is one of those issues that plagues our industry. Um, the ability to identify theft in real time is something that we haven't been able to do. Um, with distributed analytics and this high resolution data and communications with our peers, we can now start identifying unmeasured energy at the endpoint and ask our peers if they've seen that, that energy and are they measuring it. And if not, then you may have a potential theft. So now you can not send low, low level data elements back up to your back office so that you can do all that analytic um, calculations in the back office, but now the endpoint can tell you that I've seen a measurement, an energy measurement that has not been accounted for by any of my peers, there may be an identified theft. So that again is putting the analytic at the right place. You could do that in the back office, but the outcome would take you a lot longer to get to versus the endpoint itself telling you that there's a, a suspected theft. So that, those are a couple examples of, um, of the analytics and putting it in the right place. The last slide, I probably had a couple in between, but since we're down, I'll just close with this. There's lots of different models for deploying all of these analytics and, and distributed analytics. Um, one of the things that we've seen, one of the um, issues and concerns that we've seen um, by some of our utilities is the financial aspects of um, operational outcomes. So on-premise deployments are very easy to capitalize. You're putting infrastructure and hardware on-premise at the utility in the space, um, and it's very easy to recoup your costs. When you move to managed service or software as a service or actually even generating pure outcomes to the utility, the financial process around um, uh, purchasing those from a vendor or, and capitalizing those is still something that seems to be a bit of a challenge. So there's lots of different models as we move to this cloud-based um, computing. Um, I think that's one of the problems as a, as a s industry we'll have to figure out how to solve, how to move as the industry is moving to cloud computing and storage and allow those outcomes to be delivered to the utility versus having them have to install all the infrastructure in their environment. Okay. Uh, next up we have, um, poor, poor Katrina thought that she had wrecked the I screen. Did. I apologize mm -hmm. to you for that. I took um, one for you. Uh, thank, you. For you. thank you. Thank uh, you. Next up we have Larry Dickerman. He is the Senior Director of Public Policy at Landis. Larry, please. Yeah, and my message is technology is great when it works. <laughs> <laughs> no. it, it's really good to be back in Ohio. This is where I raised my family. A lot of my 43-year career in the utility industry was here, 35 years with AEP, six and a half years doing international consulting around these sorts of issues, and then a couple of years with Landis and Gear. So, you know, if you look at it, 43 years is about a third of the history of the utility industry, which is a long time. Uh, John McDonald and I both uh, started at the same time, so we've been around a long time. But Landis and Gear has been around even longer. They started in 1896. Uh, at the beginning of the industry, they've um, put in 300 million, over 300 million advanced meters. Um, they uh, have done that in over 30 countries uh, with 5,700 employees, and they um, uh, are doing the largest AMI implementation in the world, which is now 11 million out of 27 million total for Tokyo Electric. So a lot there, but we also realize that it's important for us to be in distribution automation, which we are and uh, grid analytics and uh, storage and um, 
uh, demand response programs, so a uh, pretty wide range of, of things that we do. And um, if you look at what that translates into, um, it's the uh, measurement technology, the communication technology networks, the head end, uh, where you pull it all in and make it available, and then turning the uh, collected data into usable information for decision making and intelligent applications, uh, much of uh, what we talked about previously. So this is sort of the punchline of the presentation. It's, it's pretty simple, but I think it can be profound. It's really that AMI is much more than an efficient way and an effective way to determine usage. It provi provides a foundation for improved customer experience and enhanced grid planning and operations. And I want to park on this grid planning as I've talked to utilities around the world about what you're trying to do here in Ohio. I think the one thing that really gets underestimated uh, by an order of magnitude is the importance of planning. And uh, so we need to have planning that's adva as advanced as the applications and the technologies we're looking to deploy. And uh, so quite often uh, you jump pretty quickly to here's all the wonderful things that you can do with the smart grid and the data, but you really need to be able to plan and really understand what the real impact is going to be. So, for example, uh, Landis and Gear is able to take AMI data and completely reconstruct a whole year's worth of operations in 15-minute increments or 5-minute increments or whatever the measurement is, uh, the measurement interval is, and be able to put that together in terms of a planning sandbox that says, here's what happened dynamically throughout the whole previous year in a utility that's uh, a million customers or more at a time. And we're able to then say, what happens if you uh, put a certain amount of uh, distributed energy resources on? What happens if you optimize all the capacitor controls? And then you've got real information that you can use uh, for understanding clearly uh, what the impact's going to be, uh, like uh, Paul started out talking about. So here's a, a picture of uh, what all that looks like in terms of making the data available in a, in a data repository in the center and then uh, utility infrastructure uh, and uh, utility programs uh, on either side of it. And the point is uh, we can have lots of data and a communication infrastructure, but we actually have to use the data for something useful. If you look at this picture, this is very similar to what an automotive uh, company would uh, put together in terms of how they've optimized and how they've changed over the years. When I started in the utility industry in 1974, Automobiles and cars were very similar, and the way uh, people thought about them were very similar. And there was very little automation in the automobile, and the uh, things didn't uh, uh, have a very efficient engine. They uh, used a lot of gas. They polluted a lot. They didn't stop well. Uh, they didn't handle well. And uh, you got the automobile that the, util that the uh, automotive company wanted you to have. And uh, they did a little bit of research on their customers, but it was pretty rudimentary compared to today. And fast forward to 2017, and they know exactly what their customers are thinking. They've got uh, information from exactly what you did when you drove the car that they can download. They know exactly how everything's performed when they download it. They use that information that they get from the dealerships to say, how do we improve the uh, cars going forward? They use it to dynamically uh, optimize everything on the car, so now you get great gas mileage, pollute very little, stop well, handle well. And uh, so the electric utility industry needs to go through the same transition, problem being that we're probably uh, somewhere more like a car of 1985 where we've made some progress, but there's a lot more that can be done. So as the grid is changing, so are the customers. And uh, this is just a couple of data points. There's a lot of this kind of information out there. This happens to be from Accenture that 58% of customers want their utility to provide recommendations on energy savings such as home appliances and 92% of customers want to receive personalized digital notifications. In terms of the improved customer experience, it cuts across a lot of different areas, but uh, here's uh, three, safety and reliability with advanced planning to understand conditions 24-7. Um, 
uh, daily operational insights to avoid failures in terms of knowing exactly what the condition is of each of the pieces of equipment on a, a system, especially the more critical ones, decreased brownouts, blackouts and surges, cost savings uh, by giving customers insight into usage, optimization of utility spending, uh, really knowing what the impact's going to be, improved uh, utility operational efficiency, and in terms of the environment uh, facilitating uh, electric vehicle charging, uh, helping with renewable integration, and uh, insights to reduce uh, utility system energy losses. And a little example here, going back to that planning sandbox I talked about where you can uh, reconstruct a whole year's worth of information. Uh, when I was a consultant, I did that for a half million uh, customer utility and said, let's just look at one thing. Uh, and we could have looked at many things and did look at many things and said, what if we simply optimize the controls on switch capacitors? Well, it saved $2 million uh, just, just to do that one small thing that was easy to do. So uh, a lot of opportunity here that's untapped. And certainly improving the customer experience with uh, customer portals, um, and we've talked about this uh, previously in some of the presentations, enhance customer knowledge, awareness, and management of energy usage, and creating a platform for engagement. So if you look at the key use cases uh, that utilities can use to leverage AMI data for intelligent planning and operational analytics, uh, here's several. I'll uh, talk about the first three and the last one in some detail but improving and sustaining reliability of the distribution network, uh, minimizing losses and deterring and detecting theft, improved asset management, um, maximizing the life of transformers and other grid assets. Um, we did a uh, project uh, with our grid analytics for a utility and we literally eliminated all the uh, hot weather failures of distribution transformers by having a really good understanding from the AMI data as to how each of them was loaded and proactively changing out the ones that were close to failure due to overload. Uh, pretty powerful outcome for, for that utility. Uh, reduced outages and improved restoration times, identification of voltage and power quality problems, better understanding investments in advanced technology and managing uh, renewable uh, in, in integration. So first sample use case is improving asset life using the uh, a GIS and meter data to visualize, analyze, and monitor loading on the distribution system for improved asset health. Uh, and so we can take uh, near real-time data from advanced meters and leverage it to analyze and evaluate loading on distribution assets and uh, transformers and fuses and regulators and so forth. And I think one of the points that I would make from this is what this enables is operations is usually dealt in time frames that were more like uh, uh, minutes and hours and, and a day at a time. Asset management has uh, dealt with things really more on a uh, annual cycle or a quarterly cycle or at most a monthly cycle. But what this enables uh, you to do is actually uh, do asset management uh, almost in real time and really understand the impact in near real time. So one of the uh, sort of neat things that can be done with this as an example is we have been able to take uh, the AMI data and uh, run it through a load flow analysis um, and then uh, create for a utility a list of all the things that they need to be concerned about in terms of voltage and loading on all the uh, system and uh, distill that down for each one of the operators so that every morning they can come in and say, here are the 10 things that I need to worry about today that might fail or here are some customers that are getting voltage that's high or low. And so you can proactively uh, take care of those things and not wait for a customer to have to call. Second use case is identification and reduction of uh, losses. Certainly uh, we can use the data to uh, better understand uh, what's going on with the uh, uh, meters. We've got theft detection in the meters themselves, but we've also got algorithms that basically can tell us uh, where to look uh, and try to find theft detection. And certainly there's uh, another kind of reduction of losses, which is the reduction of losses in the system itself. And uh, the kind of analysis that we can do will help us uh, uh, reduce the losses by better configuring the system, by better controlling capacitors, like I uh, mentioned earlier. And then a third uh, sample use case is understanding the impacts of DER using the AMI, GIS, and sensor data 
uh, to analyze the impact of DERs on the uh, distribution system. So uh, that would include uh, pho photovoltaics, uh, uh, DG, EV, and uh, so forth. And um, one of the things that uh, I think is important here is to recognize that uh, what this all implies is that there's a new kind of uh, integrated resource planning that's going to be required. And whether you're a state that's unbundled or not, uh, it's going to require that you start at the distribution level and say, what can we do with voltage control? What can we do with demand response? What distributed resources are out there? What does that imply in terms of uh, what the requirements are on the system 24-7, uh, 365 days a year? So again, with this planning sandbox, uh, what is it really going to require to meet the load uh, starting at the distribution level in something called a distribution resource plan and then roll that up to the uh, level where you start thinking about, so given the dynamics of what's happening at the distribution, distribution uh, system at a, at a local level, uh, what am I going to really need in terms of uh, baseload generation and peaking generation uh, to, to meet the end uh, need? And then the last use case is uh, improving uh, resiliency and uh, reliability. So we can use the GIS and outage management data along with an understanding of uh, the uh, structure of the distribution system and uh, the history of the distribution system to really say, uh, given the reliability that we have today, what is the uh, uh, best way to improve the reliability? We can do that starting with a uh, set of uh, improvements that we want to make, uh, a certain amount of safety or SATI improvement or KD improvement, and then we can say, if that's what we want to do, what's the most economic way to make those improvements? Or we can start with a budget and say, what's the most effective way to allocate the budget and uh, really make those improvements? So one of the things that uh, I think is really kind of amazing to me as I look at this whole set of issues um, in summary is that asset management has become a pretty sophisticated art within utilities and the smart grid has uh, become fairly sophisticated but really uh, when things like this use case number four we need to put uh, asset management principles to work in terms of really figuring out what part of the smart grid really gives us uh, the most bang for the buck and really be able to put together diminishing return curves uh, that are effective uh, for uh, smart grid investments, just like we do transformers and poles and the rest of the utility investment. So with that, I'll stop. Larry, thank you very much. Um, let me, I was in the process of charting out some questioning here, but <clears throat> Let me just let me let me engage in this discussion, and um, I'll, I'll lead in with some questions here, and then my fellow commissioners can <coughs> can can follow with the same line of questioning. So, look, <coughs> I think <coughs> sorry, I think what we're trying to do here is it's a tandem of <coughs> this is a little bizarre. Hold on. <coughs> It is a, it's a tandem of, um, and, 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 and I'll go on a diatribe, and really what, what I'm trying to get at is the, the cost-benefit analysis associated with these investments, because I think that element is extraordinarily important with what we're, what we're doing here. We're, we are not just going to open up a, a, a blank checkbook and say, we're super excited about technology, go do everything. That is not what we do as regulators, um, and that would not be, that, that would not be, this, this is a regulatory pun, that would not be prudent uh, for us as regulators to do. And so when I look at sort of the cost-benefit analysis and on sort of the passive customer investments, I can, I can figure out a pathway to that cost-benefit analysis because they are items that we have dealt with in the past. They're items that we currently can grasp and understand. Things like peak demand reduction, where we want to go with with our, you know, KD, SADI, SAFI metrics. Um, 
trying to figure out uh, how much power was saved on the lines through some of these investments. These are all items that I think we have traditionally um, dealt with and and have an understanding of and can touch. So my first, so the 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 f I think the first question and just 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 park this question for just a minute because I want to go into my second question. So the first question is, is it possible to conduct that kind of cost benefit analysis, knowing that there will be benefits, but is it possible to kind of conduct that type of cost benefit analysis on the front end of possibly authorizing some investment? Um, and what is the some of what is the accuracy of those cost benefit analyses? I'm concerned about that element. The other thing we're trying to do here, and this is where I think the Ohio Commission is really leading in this regard, is I mean, frankly, we're trying to start a revolution here. And 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 what I mean by that is, there is this entire world of active customer engagement applications that we have been, that we discovered in phase one or have, were, were given to us in phase one, and we're trying to chart a path for, um, uh, through this proceeding, but, but part of the difficulty with that is that we, we know we need to create this, we know that we need to create this platform to allow for these applications to proliferate, but also, Paul, to your point, which was decide what your outcomes, decide what you want your outcomes to be. Well, with with um, with Katie Sadie safety or peak demand reduction or ensuring that not as much power is lost on the wires, or, I mean, we can create those outcomes. But in the in this other, in if if we're looking at this other portion of this, if we're looking at the revolution portion, how do you chart outcomes? when I think it was the example that was used yesterday with Alexa, right? It's like, you know, when Alexa was first rolled out, it had, you know, 14 applications, whatever. Was it Mr. House at the end of the day? Mm -hmm. the, oh, House, yeah, the, 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 the last speaker yesterday. And then now that it's been, now that it's been, you know, rolled out and has become, um, you know, part of, part of, you know, smart culture. There are thousands of applications that exist. So, on that piece, how how do you how do you measure how do you measure outcomes on that side? So, again, the cost benefit analysis on some of the traditional stuff that we do, and then also how would you identify outcome? How would you identify desirable outcomes um, when on this on this more customer facing side, on the active customer engagement side, you may not have um, you may not have the you may not have the application that changes the world yet, right? But mm -hmm. when that application comes, Ohio wants to be ready. Mm -hmm. Okay, Ohio wants to be ready for its customers. Mm -hmm. Ohio wants to be ready for its businesses. Ohio wants to be at the forefront for a variety of reasons: economic development, etc. For for that revolutionary piece, if it doesn't already exist and is just sitting in you know some college student's house and he's trying he or she's trying to figure out how to make it you know bigger. Anyway. Long diatribe, but but I'd l love for you guys to address any of that if you can. Let me start. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> good questions. Uh, I think you can couch almost all the things you mentioned in terms, still in terms of what are we trying to accomplish? Why would somebody want to have an app that helps them, right? And I would argue. If you have peak time rebate is available to them, that's a reason to get the app, right? Or to put put get put Alexa to work for me, right? So um, while we don't know necessarily the form and function of all those applications, we can know why we want them to be used. And the idea that hmm, if people are going to need help managing these op these opportunities to save money. <coughs> Well, let's make that market as dynamic as possible and give as many different, whatever we can do to enable those markets, those energy management services markets, be they Honeywell or Nest trying to manage air conditioning via thermostats or Alexa or iPhone apps. Um, 
let's make let's enable those um, would, without you, knowing necessarily you know what those will be. Would you base would you base success on on customer satisfaction or number of applications or d has have you has anyone thought of that? Uh, you know what? What is what is success in that? What does success mean in 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 that realm? If you if if you were going to take this outcomes based approach, and yeah. that's an that's an approach right. you can take, yeah, right. But if you're going to take this outcomes based approach, what does success mean? Yeah, I, again, I think that's that's part of that planning process I mentioned. You have to define that. Um, for example, let's just say we want to define a successful time varying rate program as having a ten percent callable to peak demand. Um, uh, but that is one measure. I think customer satisfaction is absolutely another measure um, that you should use. Um, it's both of those things, right? People are going to appreciate the opportunity to save money. Um, even if they don't take it, they will still appreciate it. Um, and then the other uh, piece of that is how easy do you make it on them to save that money? So I think, I th I think both both of those are good measures, and that is kind of the challenge, right? You don't want to micromanage, right? You want to come up with five, ten big picture measures of what you're trying to accomplish, um, establish those, um, and then let the the utilities and the markets, you know, figure out how best to get there. Yeah, and I'll and I'll add uh, a little bit on the um, utility infrastructure. Um, it may seem like what we've always done in the past, but it is quite different, and um, it can be uh, much more granular than it has been in the past. So instead of looking at the impact of investments at peak load and uh, light load, which is typically what happens uh, with time series analysis using the AMI data, you can really understand dynamically exactly what happens all the time and, and get a real cost benefit uh, that um, isn't some sort of a, a gross uh, estimation that you know is plus or minus 20 or 30 percent, but really understand the real impact mm. of the investments. But it does take something to get there, and that is uh, you know a willingness to invest some in uh, grid analytics that are more sophisticated than what we have today. And that part, I, I'm quite confident uh, that that you can get to the place where you've got some real assurance as to what the benefit side is. Okay. Any if other could, thoughts? Yep, if ahead. I could ask, add another little bit to that um, by, by probably the world's most overused analogy. Um, so does anybody happen to remember which year the first two nodes of the internet were connected together? Yeah. It was actually probably longer ago than you would have guessed. 1969 is the answer. So in 1969, did the folks who were putting that together have a clear picture about what it would look like today or what it would be used for? I am almost certain the answer is no. So what instead that they did, I think is probably useful part of the analogy for, for you, is to value flexibility uh, by enabling things to happen uh, beyond even their understanding back then, to be able to have different kinds of equipment, to be able to have different kinds of applications, all use this same infrastructure uh, was tremendously useful and it makes it how valuable it is today, is that we have all these different applications we can run, all these different things that we can do yeah. with the same thing. <clears throat> can, I, can I follow up on that, which is the thing that probably will weigh on us as we chart this path is that I don't know I don't know if we're different than other industries that have experienced this evolution or revolution in that you know we've we 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 regulate we regulate an authorized cost recovery for utilities to build this infrastructure out and so this concept of future proofing and making sure that you've selected the right tech or the right component of the platform, um, that that piece I will un, will be undoubtedly concerning to us because mm -hmm. I mean the thing is is that you know you don't know if you don't know what you don't know. And so um, 
you know, in the private sector, you put together the wrong component of the platform, you invest in scrapping it, and you start again. Well, mm -hmm. here, it's ratepayer mm -hmm. dollars yeah. that have likely been utilized to roll something out that has then become a major piece of your platform, and and you'll have to scrap it. So, so I guess I'm I'm saying flexibility is a little more flexibility is a little more challenging here, and I may not fully understand the tech that's being de deployed, and maybe there can be some flexibility there within that tech. But that but but understandably that would be a concern of ours. That would be a concern of you know, Consumers Council, and frankly, all the stakeholders that, that um, participate in proceedings in Ohio. So anyone address that? I, I, know, I would Katrina, love to, because I think it's a continuation. I think one of the important things is picking a platform. I think you had a discussion yesterday, and I wasn't here on platform. Um, it's about picking a platform and a technology that can leverage unknown features and functionalities and benefits to you, and openness and standards that are not just proprietary to any specific, specific vendor gives you that sense of flexibility without the fear of deploying a technology that will be obsolete, um, like IP. Um, so I think that's a key, is picking a, designing a platform that has capabilities beyond what you want to do today to what you haven't even imagined, but doing, a, creating that platform with standards that, aren't, that are continuing to evolve, um, that give you the flexibility to integrate additional um, product types and and solutions um, without changing the underlying platform and infrastructure. Okay, got it. So there, but there, so there are all of all of these different components of the platform, mm -hmm. but <clears throat> the technology exists today, whereby you could authorize the 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 construction of a particular piece of the platform that that in and of itself is malleable and can be built upon. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, the wor I think the worst case, the doomsday scenario for all of us in this is you authorize expenditures to build out this platform, then it's like, oh, this was garbage, got to scrap it all, start over, right? I mean, that, that, is, that is the doomsday scenario. But has the tech advanced to a point where you can, you can without having to scrap it and start all over, you can, um, you know, push, pull, new, maybe, new, maybe a software tweak, et cetera, mm -hmm. for, and, and, and again, this is, this is hard for us, right? Yeah. I mean, this, is, this is really intent, technology yeah, intensive. Right. And so, um, you know, the, just your thoughts are, 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 are helpful. Katrina, that, was, that yeah. was very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, well, uh, well actually, yeah, well, I mean, we do tweaks all the time to the technology, and uh, we certainly are open to uh, anybody's, um, uh, that second slide I had that had the five steps, uh, anywhere along that line, anybody's technology can fit into ours, so we're making it very open. But uh, we tweak it as we go, certainly, but there comes a point where uh, the technology advances to the point where it's so much further and so much cheaper, then the question really isn't does it still work or is it still used and useful, the question is, do you still want to use it? It's, it's just like your uh, computer at home. It's not that the old one quit working. It's that uh, all of a sudden the new one was so cheap and had so much more power and opened up some possibilities. So it, it's really going to be much more like that than the old technology just doesn't work anymore. Paul? Let me give you another uh, kind of competitive industry uh, analogy to think about. So my background is product development and product management. And um, I encourage you to look at this uh, as developing a new product. You got 11 million IOU electric customers in Ohio. If you're going to spend 800 to $1,000 per customer on grid modernization over the next 10 years, that's $11 billion. You got to know what your product specifications are, right? So, what do we want this to do? So if you can do that, let the utilities and the, and the vendors, you know, figure out a little bit about what the best technology is to get there. And then, and then you might have to feedback loop a few times. As I mentioned in my planning process, you may say, ooh, I don't like the cost, you know, of that particular uh, product specification requirement. Maybe I can cut back a little bit on that one um, or figure out a cheap, cheaper way to get there. So that's what I would stick to. So for example, um, do we want, let's say we want to enable this uh, energy management services market. What kind of communications with the meters is that going to require? You know, Ed had a nice diagram, I think, of how, how we could get that data back into people's hands in near real time. Well, 
what are those paths along the way and what does the bandwidth and the capabilities need to be to be able to enable that functionality? Maybe we want to establish that, um, uh, well, I want 50% of customers to be able to access their data in near real time or their authorized representatives to access that data in near real time simultaneously. Is that what we want? That's not a bad, it's not a bad one. Or do we want it to be 100%? Or is it good enough to have 4%? Or do we not need it at all, right? So I think establishing what those product specifications are up front is, is the key. If I were to go to Apple or 3M or Procter & Gamble and say, well, I need, a, I need $10 billion to do this, but I'm not going to tell you exactly what yeah. it's going to do yeah. for people. I'm not right. going to tell you exactly what the capabilities are going to be. I'd get laughed out of the room, you know? So, it, yeah. so I'm trying to bridge this back to your first question, Mr. Chairman, which was, can you even do this? Is it possible? Are we going to be right? It's possible, you're not gonna be right, but you gotta start you know, somewhere. And yeah. I think product specifications is one way yeah. to think about doing That's that. That's great, and that ties back into the, uh, to the standards discussion that we had, exactly. we're having yesterday, which is, which is helpful. Anyone wanna build on that? Beth, go ahead, please. Well, I, I'm still thinking about what Larry mentioned of don't underestimate the value of planning. Yeah. And so I guess I wanted to elaborate, you to elaborate a little bit more on that. Like, what do you mean by that? How do people underestimate the value of planning? Well, as, as I, and it's not unique to um, the United States, it, it was happening all over the world. It's sort of like people quickly jump to all the things that you can do with the smart grid. You can dynamically control this and you can have this application or this thing that you can do. But in terms of really understanding uh, the, uh, the benefit side of the equation and what is it really going to do to the system, uh, there's, there's very little there. Um, and so uh, right now in California, for example, they're really working hard at uh, developing the distribution uh, planning uh, platform. And we talked yesterday about the DOE effort in terms of distribution system planning. And uh, there just needs to be something that instead of, like I said previously, looking at, at, at peak load, light load, uh, looking at a couple of points in time during the year actually enables you to truly understand uh, the impact. So that becomes very important for things like distributed energy resources. Uh, is a, a circuit in Columbus, Ohio, in Dublin, able to handle 5% uh, penetration of solar or 30%? Uh, you know, how do you really know that if you don't really understand the dynamics of uh, what it's doing to the system, how it's coming on and off, and, um, and what that really means for the control of the voltage on the system, and what that uh, means ultimately for uh, uh, what you need in capacity. So uh, it, it's really just a matter of um, what we used to understand and, and what used to be adequate uh, in terms of understanding at peak load, light load, we really need to understand what happens all year long if we're really gonna understand the economics. Anyone else have a follow-up to that? Yeah, I would say that uh, amplifying on that same idea, um, you, you don't necessarily have to be right, uh, but it's prudent to minimize the cost of being wrong. And that's, that's the direct benefit of having flexibility that I'd mentioned earlier. Uh, the planning is probably more um, associated with maybe requirements gathering, to use Paul's analogy to product development, than in the actual engineering of design. Mm -hmm. So what I would suspect uh, your role is likely to be is to say, here are the things that are important. Um, how, we, how we get there is outside the realm of what we're going to dictate. Mm -hmm. uh, but what we will say is here are the things that are important to the people of Ohio. Okay. Dan. Um, that last uh, comment, um, Ed, as well as comments that Larry made earlier, um, kind of triggered, I don't know if it's an epiphany or not, but probably much, much less uh, impactful than that. But um, it seems to me that everybody wants no one would disagree that we want to end up with a least cost or a reasonable cost result for customers, and we want to have lots of benefits from those costs. We want to have a solid platform. We want to have flexibility. We want to have 
to, to be able to accommodate future developments. We want to have interoperability so that no one's shut out from being a contributor to the, to the pipeline of benefits. And we provide, we maximize choice and we maximize the ability to control customer, customers to control their destinies. Um, and, and we want to do it at a, on a least cost basis for customers. Um, but what I, what I wonder is whether we should focus on some of the important things and not get bogged down in whether or not, I think I agree with what you also say, Paul, about um, the need to plan, to, to know where we're aiming for, to try to figure out where we're aiming, and then try to figure out whether we, what kind of a job we did hitting the target. I think that's a good idea too. But are there, is there low hanging fruit? Are there priorities that we can focus on, the important things first, that are almost without doubt um, low risk of failure and high risk of success and things that, that, ben that will benefit others, things that improve reliability on the, on the grid, not the, not the edge side, but the utility side, things that help to provide for resiliency. Um, it, those seem to me pretty obvious things that improve the efficiency of the grid itself, those seem to be fairly obvious to me. Um, and, and so what are, the, what are the priorities, Larry? What are the, the things that we have to have in place in order that are necessary components, everyone would agree with, that we don't have currently, that we need to have in order to get us to this area where we're a little more uncertain about what we should be doing next? Yeah. Um, so, so advanced metering infrastructure seems to be something that I keep hearing, seems to be a, a, a assumed that we should, be, we should have that. Maybe that's right, maybe that's not. A good communication systems um, for, for, the, for, the, for the platforms out there that we're creating. What, what, are the, what are the low hanging fruit? What are the highest priorities that are likely to almost, you know, be most close to certainly not uh, posing risk of failure? Yeah, I think the short answer is an AMI system with a uh, strategy for how you're actually going to use the data in a way that um, really uh, targets the, the part of the utility system where the money is being spent. So what do I mean by that? Uh, obviously, there's the benefits of AMI in terms of uh, meter reading cost and and uh, understanding the bills and so so many of those things, but to take that information and to be able to do things in the asset management realm where you're talking about massive amounts of money being spent every year uh, on replacements and um, and on improving the system, to be able to do that uh, in a better way, it only takes a fraction of a percent of improvement, and and it's it's big money that that causes it to pay for itself. So. With the example I used uh, with the utility that we eliminated all the distribution transformer failures, uh, you know, we took the AMI data, and that's just one example of many, and uh, we're able to say, uh, based on real understanding of how those transformers were loaded, not just what they are at peak, not just sort of guessing, but what the real load is and how long the load was there, we were able to use an algorithm and say, here's the ones that are gonna fail, and let's go ahead and proactively replace those that saves them money in two ways. They don't have to send somebody out on an emergency basis. And second, they end up with a transformer that's reusable and the thing was gonna fail anyway. And uh, so you multiply that across all assets and uh, that starts to become uh, substantial money. Using this information to better prioritize reliability improvements uh, is, is another uh, really good area. Um, and then uh, being able to uh, understand how to reduce losses is, is another big one. So, yeah. I'd like to ask uh, Katrina, um, in regards to keeping the theme of the low hanging fruit, and we're talking about AMI and uh, smart meters, and you mentioned that um, you know, we get so much data that we don't use at this time. Um, I just wondered your opinion of, um, of you know, full deployment of, of these technologies at this time. Um, 
What do you have to say about that? Uh, the fact that we're not using we're not using all the data that we're harvesting. Right. Yeah, I think um, it goes back to the previous discussion with low-hanging fruit. So when people first deploy these systems, they know the capabilities are harvesting a lot of data. Um, some of the things they underestimate is the amount of data repository, um, data storage that would be required to house all this data. Um, so that's one thing that I think it's underestimated. Once people get to full deployment and their initial payoff, um, with their original planned business objectives, um, they then start looking at ways to utilize that data um, beyond what they originally planned for. So I think when you start systems, what we see is that they focus on their original objectives. They Once they accomplish those, they then start looking at all the additional benefits of the data that they're collecting and how they can use those. California is a great example of that. So I think um, although we're not harvesting it we're harvesting way more than they're using. I think they're using way more than they originally developed business outcomes for as well. I think that's a, a natural evolution as you get through full saturation to your generation of your payback on your original investment. You start finding ways to extend that, the asset life and value, and that data is all important to that. So I think from the beginning of a project to where you know five years into a project, the amount of data used is um, incremental. Um, for sure. Did that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Commissioner? Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, Ed, I am not a data nerd, but I know exactly what it costs me to run my hair dryer on a monthly basis. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, well, <laughs> I had to say it. I'm sorry. Larry, uh, I, I appreciated the distinction that you, you drew between data and information. A former colleague many, yep. many years ago once told me that you could drown in a sea of data yet thirst for meaningful information. Mm -hmm. um, so having said that, the importance of the data is a foundation upon which to extract and reconfigure and reformat and then provide meaningful information to an end user, I think, is, is key. If, if you agree with that basic premise, uh, the data warehouses which will contain the data are micro and macro, I think, in the sense that it could be behind the meter or on the utility side of the meter. It could be uh, individual or aggregate data. Uh, and as a result, w where do you guys see the data warehouses existing? Who manages the data warehouses that you see existing? And then I think there was a consensus yesterday that we likely won't reach this mega warehouse. Uh, so is it important that these mini warehouses are compatible or interoperable? And is that better or worse in terms of cyber risk? So a lot of questions. That's, that Sorry. Yeah, I, I would just offer one one opening comment, and that is um, the uh, pushing of the uh, data and uh, the action that's being taken with the data out to the edge of the grid certainly has uh, a lot of benefits because I've been involved with multiple major storm restorations over the years, more than I can count. And there's almost, almost always a breakdown of the communication infrastructure one way or another in those events. So you have to plan on the fact that I'm going to have some technology that's pretty powerful uh, in terms of uh, those kind of events. And uh, I want it to be able to do what it needs to do without having to communicate back to uh, the, the center, uh, the, the central hub. And so I think uh, increasingly people are, are, are thinking that having the ability to operate independent, but at the same time report back what it's doing, uh, but it can have some latency there and doesn't have to be immediate is kind of the best way to think about it uh, for, for grid operational purposes at least. Yeah, I'd like to emphasize that point as well. So first, one, one way to very effectively um, avoid any cybersecurity risk of data breaches is not to have the data. Uh, one way to do that would be exactly what Larry just described, which is essentially to ask the question, why, why do we gather this data in the first place? It's, it's not just as a hobby. Uh, presumably, we want to do something with that. And to the degree we can identify those applications for the data, and even better, delegate those to machines that are actually deployed somewhere in the grid, 
to say that here is the data that I received, here's the decision I made to, to make an adjustment, to, to make a change of setting, and then report the fact that I got this data, that I made this change, report that to a central head end, then except for audit purposes and maybe quality purposes, you don't really need the data as much. To the degree that we can enable that kind of distributed intelligence, I think we benefit a great deal. I agree 100 percent. I, I think it's, you know, making smart data intelligent data. Um, so turning the bits and pieces of data into outcomes, right? It's solving problems and passing that solved data outcome upstream. So you've removed the need to pass low-level granular data through the system because um, now you can identify, um, actively identify solutions to problems and pass that data upstream. I agree 100 percent. Okay, here's what we're going to do. We are going to break. Panelists, if you don't mind, I, the, the staff didn't get to ask you questions, unfortunately. If you don't mind just hanging out in case um, Christina, Tim, or Jake have questions, we'd really appreciate that. This is a wonderful presentation from all of you this morning. We greatly appreciate it. And we'll be back at 11, but a round of applause for these panelists.